Okay, good evening everyone and welcome to the first instalment of the 2023 Institute for Northern Studies public seminar series. It's lovely to see so many of you in the audience tonight and a warm welcome to those who are joining us for the first time. For those who don't know me, my name is Dr Andrew Lind. I'm a lecturer at the Institute for Northern Studies and it's my great pleasure to be chairing these sessions. Now, before I introduce tonight's speaker, I want to thank everyone for bearing with us. We had a couple of technical difficulties, but we're, we're underway now. Um, and I've just got a couple of technical points to make before we can kick off. First is just to make everyone aware that we are recording tonight's session so you can relive the experience at your leisure uh, over on the INS YouTube channel at any time. And the second and final point that I need to make is just to let everyone know about questions to the speaker. You're all very welcome to submit questions at any point during the, the paper tonight uh, and we'll collect them and address them to our speaker at the end. To do so, please submit them via the chat function on your screen. So don't use the Q&A, please use the chat. And when you send those questions in, please make sure that you send them to all panelists. And that just ensures that none of them fall through the gaps. Now, tonight, we are absolutely thrilled to welcome Dr. Adrian Maldonado. Dr. Maldonado is currently the Galloway Horde researcher at National Museum Scotland. He received his PhD in archaeology at the University of Glasgow in 2011, with his thesis entitled Christianity and Burial in Late Iron Age Scotland, 400 to 650 AD. He's lectured in archaeology at the Universities of Glasgow and Chester and joined uh, the National Museum in 2018 as the Glenmorangie Research Fellow. That project involved a reassessment of the museum collections covering the 9th to 12th centuries, which culminated in the publication of Crucible of Nations, Scotland from Viking Age to Medieval Kingdom, which was published in 2021. Currently, he's a postdoctoral research assistant on the HRC funded project Unwrapping the Galloway Horde at the museum. And tonight, Adrian will be presenting a reassessment of Viking Age objects in the National Museum Scotland's collection with his paper entitled The Viking Age Reuses of Insular Metalwork from Northern Britain. A very warm welcome to you, Adrian. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, everybody. Can you hear me OK? Yes, we're all good. OK, great. Let's see if I can share this then and then we're off. Okay, let me know if you can see that as well. That's coming through now. Okay, great. Well, thanks, Andrew, and thanks everybody for coming tonight. Uh, as you heard already, uh, I'm very lucky to call myself a Galloway Horde researcher at National Museum Scotland. Uh, but before that, I joined the museum for the first time in 2018 as Glenmorangie Research Fellow on the long running Glenmorangie Research Project. It is a project that is funded uh, by the Glenmorangie Company. Uh, they've undertaken new research on the early medieval collections in National Museum Scotland uh, from 2008 to 2021. Uh, my phase of the project culminated in this book, and the remit was. Uh, everything in the museum's collections from the year 800 to about 1200, so the 9th to the 12th centuries, which happens to be uh, what we usually call the Viking Age, but a lot of other things are going on in Scotland at that time as well. Uh, this is the time period where we last hear of the Pictish kingdoms, and we first hear of the kingdom called Alaba, uh, which then becomes the kingdom of Scotland by the end of this time period. Uh, it's the last time we hear of the kingdom of Dalriata in the west, and that becomes subsumed into this new entity called Alaba. It is the arrival of Norse speakers. It is the uh, uh, the arrival of a kingdom called England further south, which does in this period still have territory in what we now call Scotland. So it's all kind of a really interesting mix of people, languages, and places, not just the Vikings. Uh, that's kind of the point of this book here. But today, I do indeed want to focus on the Vikings because there is a particular category of evidence that they leave behind uh, within graves and within hordes that I think we would do well to kind of look at in a more critical way. And I guess the only way to call it, the only way to really uh, uh, summarize it in a word is loot, the uh, material taken away from Viking raids. 
we have lots of historical references to Viking raids. And in Ireland, we do have evidence that some of those raids resulted in the, uh, uh, the sort of stealing, the taking away of objects as well as people. And here in this one incredible object from the Isle of Butte, we have this doodle on a bit of slate. This was a monastic school where they were teaching children how to write in Latin and in the Ogham alphabet as well. And on one of these little slates found in amongst all the sort of practice letters uh, was this little drawing. And it looks like it was done by a small child, somebody at the school. And the central figure there is you know, a guy with very long hair, with what looks like chain mail and a sword or something else dangling between his legs there. And he's striding purposefully uh, with a couple of other fellas uh, uh, who are dressed the same way, striding purposefully towards what looks for all the world like a Viking longship with an animal headed prow and maybe a sail or a tent. Uh, uh, so this is what looks like a doodle of a Viking raid in action. And then there's that other figure to the left. He's being sort of led away, it seems, by the central figure. Uh, he looks very different. He's not dressed the same way. Uh, he's got a great big bushy beard. Uh, he's got something dangling from his wrists and it seems to be chained not to the Viking guy, but to himself. Uh, if uh, if anything, this looks like it could be either a padlock, padlock and chains, but again, he's chained to himself in that case. It's more likely that what we're looking at there, uh, if you can't see it, uh, is probably more like a house-shaped reliquary, the kind of thing that a bishop or an abbot or a high-ranking clergy uh, would have held, would have carried around. And that's what that little carrying strap, that little hinge that you see on the left is for. It's uh, to for the the ease of transport. Okay, so it looks like a very specific scene that maybe this child has either witnessed or has been told about, but is it certainly top of mind, present in this kid's mind, and he's uh, making this depiction of it. And so we have this one thing which could be a depiction of uh, this looting, but also this sort of taking of hostages and captives all together at once. It's an incredible uh, little document, this thing. And it sort of feeds into what we think we know about the Viking Age. Uh, there's other large deposits where we have the archaeological signature of what looks like a series of raids or one very successful raid. This is, uh, it's a, a, a large assemblage of material that was dredged out of the River Blackwater uh, in uh, what's now Northern Ireland. It's called the Shan Mullah Horde or the Blackwater Horde. And it consists of dozens and dozens and dozens of objects and almost invariably all of them chopped up or hacked up or fragmented in some way. And these are uh, almost invariably things that are sort of uh, seemingly picked up from the local area, local metalwork, insular art rather than Scandinavian art, uh, uh, and very few things that couldn't have been got from uh, uh, from not far from the local area, basically. Uh, it looks like a big, huge pile of loot, basically, and everything's all chopped up uh, into little fragments. Okay, and so we have other Viking hordes with insular material in them. And every time that one of these comes out of the ground and we see insular things, our first instinct is to say, that's loot. That's stuff that's been plundered uh, from a Christian site or from an insular site in these cases, Anglo-Saxon, Pictish, whatever the case may be, uh, and then hoarded in the ground. So taken out of its context and buried in a way that it wouldn't have been uh, used, basically, uh, in at that local context, okay? Uh, uh, it's been taken out of its usual form of circulation and put into the ground. In these cases, like with the very famous Galloway Horde, the project that I'm currently working on, um, there's insular material like this pectoral cross with its sort of chain still wrapped around it. There are several Anglo-Saxon Viking, uh, uh, Anglo-Saxon brooches uh, that are complete and undamaged uh, dropped into this hoard alongside huge big piles of silver bars and silver arm rings, what looks like money basically and possessions on the one hand. So when this came out of the ground, the initial thought was this is another classic but spectacular Viking horde, more Viking loot. And the more you've more we've been able to look into the Galloway Horde, okay, uh, the less and less tidy that story becomes. We found that those piles of silver arm rings 
which we associate with the Viking world of the Irish Sea. They're probably be being, being made in Dublin and places like these and traded. Uh, um, uh, 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 and uh, it, it's a kind of a, a form of currency. Uh, some of these arm rings that we found in the lower deposit of the Galloway Hoard have runes on the back, and they're not Norse runes, as you might expect, but in fact, they're Anglo-Saxon runes. And these on the left here have fragments of words that we can read, but we can't really understand. But bear, till, and ed, these are elements of uh, uh, the old English language. They're word elements. They mean simple things, and they might be abbreviations of someone's name. But we have one complete name on another arm ring, which was found on the site after the Galloway Horde was excavated. Uh, they, they sort of opened up a trench um, to see the context of the site. And this is one of the finds from the plow soil. It's got more Anglo-Saxon runes, and it spells out an English name, Egbert, a very common English name, especially in Northumbria. It is basically the name of anybody. Uh, it could be the name of any uh, any number of people who we know were living and operating in Northumbria in the sort of ninth and tenth centuries. Okay, so what we have here is what looked for all the world like a Viking horde, but signed, it seems, by its owners or its donors, who all seem to be English speakers, uh, literate in Anglo-Saxon rather than Norse runes. And so that's kind of uh, thrown this notion of a Viking horde on its head. Here is something that looks like a Viking horde, but it actually may have been deposited by non-Vikings, I suppose, or at least English speakers. Uh, and that kind of opens up a lot of questions. Um, and this is something it kind of adds fuel to this notion that has been sort of building up over time that not every single one of these massive silver hordes that is buried in the ground around the 8th and 9th centuries was necessarily buried by Vikings. And it was not necessarily buried uh, uh, even by uh, 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 people who are involved in that trade at all. John Sheehan has got this uh, wonderful article in a recent edited volume where he talks about the role of the church and how many of the Irish silver Viking Age hordes are actually found on church land or sometimes in churches and in churchyards themselves. And he draws attention to a uh, rare but, uh, 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 but interesting little subset of silver ingots that have crosses marked onto them. And these that you see from the Curedale horde are some of the largest and heaviest uh, silver ingots in the entire horde. It looks like these are being made for and maybe given as tribute to the church. And so some of this, some of the spoils of war, the silver piles that are sort of being buried in the ground at this time, some of that is being gifted or given as tribute, uh, maybe for buying land or maybe just for buying the peace. And so the implication is that the things that end up in the ground that we call Viking Age are not always just simply Viking objects. Uh, and there's there's an example here of one of these coin hoards from the end of the 10th century now that's buried in the middle of a functioning monastery. Uh, and so we begin to sort of, uh, uh, we're able now to kind of ask new questions about all of this kind of material. And we have objects like these where where there's clearly been a bit of Christian metalwork. Some of these things have uh, cruciform designs on them. These are things like glass studs and mounts from Christian reliquaries and book shrines and book covers that have been chopped up and then placed on top of a little cake of lead. And they're acting as weights for balance scales. This seems to be the sort of incontrovertible evidence that Christian material is not just being traded or sold. It's also being chopped up. It's also being cut up. And that speaks to us of disrespect, of a lack of recognition from a pagan perspective that these are sacred objects. And that feeds into, again, that message of uh, uh, pagans with a violent vendetta against uh, the church against Christianity and raiding these monasteries, not just for uh, wealth, but because it is against their beliefs somehow. Uh, and, and so there's a lot of this kind of evidence and conflicting evidence as well. I want to draw out some examples now from the National Museum of Scotland's collection to see if we can kind of revisit this notion of loot 
and what it means, I suppose, to break up these objects and repurpose them. And I don't know, one really interesting thing that's come up in, in, in recent literature is that Christian, you know, Christian objects like this pattern, like chalices, can themselves be hoarded. But when they don't have coins or arm rings, we tend to call them sort of safety deposits. It's hoards buried before the Vikings could uh, could get uh, could get access to them. They're hidden away from Vikings, uh, and, and so we have one explanation for hoards with Christian objects, and another explanation with hoards with lots of silver. Uh, but they're all being deposited at the, the very same time, and sometimes in the same kind of areas in and around churches. And the one really striking thing about this famous object is got these beautiful glass studs, the kind of thing that you could easily pop off and put on top of one of those lead weights. Oh, it's interesting. Interesting <laughs> and, and maybe a little bit scary is that um, there's evidence that they're making things like these. This is a lead model for making one of these glass studs in one of these uh, Viking towns in Hedeby, uh, uh, which is in southern Scandinavia, one of these towns where all of this loot is coming in and being repurposed. Here we have evidence of maybe a, a, a person, a metal worker, uh, a glass worker in this case, being brought over there and starting to make these things abroad. You know, so we are in the situation where not everything that looks insular necessarily must have been looted from a monastery, you know? So that's maybe a little bit dangerous and a little bit unexpected, but I think that is really interesting. And that's where we can maybe uh, jolt ourselves into thinking anew about some of these old objects. And so loot or maybe not loot at all. Uh, and if not, then what? What can we say about this that's maybe more constructive and maybe more interesting? Okay, let's start with things that are clearly loot, things that have been chopped up, things that have been uh, repurposed in some way. And that's the majority of these things. So Egon Vammer's very famous study in the 1980s, 1985, uh, 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 categorized and cataloged some 200 objects of insular manufacture made somewhere in England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, that had been repurposed and deposited in Scandinavia. Some 200 objects, and out of all of those, it was something like 75% were ecclesiastical objects. And then the rest of them were belts and harnesses and swords and things like these. The majority of them were Christian metalwork. So they have a, a taste for these kinds of things in Scandinavia. Okay, uh, we have very interesting things uh, sometimes deposited in a complete state. So we have this D-shaped finial, which seems to have come off of a shrine, but it seems to have been ripped off of that shrine. So this object on the left was buried complete, but only after it had been ripped off of something else. This crozier from Sweden uh, was buried complete and only the head survives in a good state, but it seems like the entire crozier was indeed taken back to Sweden. Uh, and, and then you have panels like these, which have been removed from their parent object, but then also chopped and sort of riveted. You can actually see the iron, uh, uh, sorry, the copper alloy uh, nail that they've used here. Uh, um, and these things, uh, uh, sorry, these things have been argued uh, because of the nature of that art, the way that there's snakes and some of the snakes have human heads and some of them have bird heads. That's very similar to the art that you're getting in stone on the island of Iona and in the Iona School of Art, like illuminated manuscripts, like the Book of Kells. So these things maybe have come from a Columban monastery, if not the monastery of Iona itself, which was certainly raided several times at the start of the Viking Age. Some of these things had a really colorful history. This object that I showed you ended up in a collection in Paris, but in almost, it, it seems to be an identical object in a much worse state was found in a Viking grave. This is the person that you see reconstructed here on the right. She's known as the Gausel Queen. Uh, she was buried with all of the sort of usual high status gear. She's wearing oval brooches, uh, uh, one on each side, one on each shoulder, more or less, um, and with drinking horns and a full horse's head dressed, uh, the horse was, with all of its bridal gear and all of these mounts, uh, but still chopped off uh, and, and placed at this woman's feet. This looks like a very 
super pagan deposit. Uh, interestingly, by the head in a box, uh, there were a couple of uh, mounts, and this Christian object was one of them. Uh, and it's interesting, I think, that it wasn't repurposed in some way. It wasn't made into a brooch. It was kept special in a box and sort of buried uh, along with all of this other gear. Okay, this is not the only time that it happens. Uh, there's other graves uh, that we know about that have complete, in this case, objects or more or less complete, like this house-shaped reliquary of a similar kind to the one I showed you from Money Musk, which was also buried in a woman's grave. In fact, Egon Vammer's study showed that very long ago already, that most of this looted metalwork, this material, uh, is deposited overwhelmingly in female graves. So there is a specific way of using these things once they get to Scandinavia. And they're not always ripped up. Uh, they're not always hacked to pieces, okay? This is probably deposited more or less complete uh, in this person's grave, similar to the one uh, bit of metalwork from the Gaussel Queen. So this is just to sort of emphasize that there are things that are kept and not just sort of chopped up. Uh, 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 but in, uh, for every one of those, there's uh, lots of evidence of things like these. So here's another house-shaped reliquary that was found uh, in a Viking grave. It is now on display in the uh, Museum of Denmark in Copenhagen. Okay, and you can see that it's missing those hinges, those carrying straps that they would have had on either side. Coincidentally, we actually have a pair of carrying straps that have been repurposed from Scotland. I'm not saying that these are matching objects. I think it's an interesting pattern that is emerging. Uh, um, this one on your right is missing those two hinges. This one on the left are is that uh, a pair of hinges from a similar object. The ones on the left, though, have been repurposed. They've been refitted with a pin on their back to make them into shoulder brooches. So instead of wearing the typical Scandinavian costume of oval-shaped brooches, uh, this person has uh, opted to take this Christian metalwork, repurpose it, dismantle it seemingly very carefully, and repurpose it in this way for display. So there is a world in which these things are being used simply because they look funky and different when you take them back to Norway or Sweden. But this is an example among many uh, of these things from Britain and Ireland, where they haven't traveled necessarily very far from their parent objects or where their parent objects were looted. And I wonder if there's a different message being sent. If you bring an object like this all the way back across the sea to Scandinavia, that tells you something about that object. It is important because it has traveled a long way. It's a trophy from a far off land. If you do the same thing, but it only ends up in the Hebrides, probably close to a monastery where it was found, is it really telling you the same message? Is it only Scandinavian people who are looking? Are there insular people who recognize this object? And what message is it telling them? There's a lot more richness to these kinds of stories if we see it in their local context and not just as sort of treasure objects. And this is just an, a, a recently uh, a located example, just to give you a sense of just the richness of the kinds of objects. You can see this one is another uh, strap, a hinge strap from one of those reliquaries. It's got this lovely beast head with a snarling snout, you know? So this is a, a beast head that's sort of uh, grasping something with its teeth and it's inset with amber. And it's got these sort of writhing, twisted creatures in here. And then you can see the hole blasted through it from when it's been repurposed. It just kind of reminds you of the quality and the ornate nature of these things. But we'll meet some of these designs and motifs again. Uh, there's something that they're after and there's repeated instances of using things like the hinges of these reliquary shrines or the reliquary shrine uh, as a complete box. So there are recurring patterns. And again, it doesn't just show up in Norway and Sweden and even in Scandinavian parts of Britain. Here's an example of just one of these uh, 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 hinges. This one doesn't necessarily appear to have been reused, but it has sort of come off of its, uh, of its parent object, and it's found in a native, a royal Cranog site there at Langorse. I think there's more sort of repurposing of these things in both the Viking and the insular worlds, and I think we give them credit for to come back to the Shan Mullah, the Blackwater Horde, here's some more examples of shrines like those. What you're looking at, object 237 on top there, 
the original state is as you see it, uh, as it was found in the top left. It's the gable mount of the top of one of those house-shaped reliquaries, but it's been bent. It's been removed and then bent into this sort of drunken boxer uh, kind of shape that you see there. And you can see it straightened out in reconstruction. It's got a kind of little animal head at either end. And that's interesting because we see those repeatedly uh, from uh, house-shaped shrines. In fact, the one from Melhus has, uh, that I showed you earlier has a very similar back-turned beast. But it's interesting that we have two, three, four examples of this exact kind of monument, the gable with those back-turned beasts separated from its parent object. And in all three cases, seemingly done very carefully. Uh, although 237 there has been bent after the fact. So I think, uh, uh, again, just I'm, I'm flagging these up to say that there are sort of patterns, there is a directionality and maybe an intentionality to how these things are being fragmented and then possibly also reused. We don't have provenance, I should say, for these uh, 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 objects that you see on the right. Only the ones from the left are from the Shan Mullah Horde. These other ones are stray objects that have come down to us and are now in museum collections in Ireland and in Scotland. But I think they're sort of, uh, they betoken uh, a, a wider pattern of fragmentation of these objects and the retention of specific objects for that purpose. And maybe they have a specific meaning on their own. Even when an object is fragmented and reused, sometimes we see it being treated with uh, a, a great amount of care. So these are two very strange objects. Uh, we don't actually know what the parent object of these could have been. They're very strange shapes and they, they're almost certainly off of a Christian reliquary, but actually we don't know. And that's another thing that I find really fascinating about these objects, these insular objects that are in Viking Age graves. They actually preserve things that haven't been preserved through the vagaries of time in Scotland, Ireland, and England themselves. So they form kind of a window onto the Christian period, even if they are found in pagan graves. Um, so this one is just an elaborate one on the left there. The one on the right is interesting because it was found in its grave, uh, uh, seemingly wrapped in textile, as in it was sort of uh, shrouded like, uh, like many objects were. Sometimes in men's graves in the Viking Age, their swords or their shields might be shrouded, might be wrapped in textile. And this object was not worn, but treated uh, separately, like the Gausel Queen mount. Maybe this was a treasured object kept in a separate part of the grave, maybe in a box or a bag collection, but sort of uh, uh, wrapped and treated with care. Okay, but some other objects, again, we're not so lucky. We can come back to those lead weights. I showed you these on the right. Those are from Scotland and they're now in Dumfries Museum. We have many examples of Christian metalwork, things like these being repurposed. And again, in many cases, things that don't really survive very well. The one on the left has maybe come from a quite elaborate bucket, the kind of thing that could have been used for, uh, 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 for baptism, for carrying holy water. And this central one from Cumbria uh, is completely filled with lead. It would have been a very heavy weight indeed. It would have been a quite large and ostentatious weight to use for weighing very large amounts of, well, whatever it is, silver, gold, you name it. Okay, but it's come off of a shrine of a kind that really does not exist. If that's really an 8th or a ninth century object, there really is no parallel for that thing. It would have been really an elaborate thing. Uh, and you can see, again, that it's been sort of preserved just for the head you know, and it's interesting how many of these lead weights do actually incorporate heads, heads of animals, heads of human figures. And if not, however often, uh, um, where, where it isn't, where it's an abstract design, it's a, a quite often a cruciform design. So again, I think there is an intentionality to what is being reused as uh, 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 lead weights and things. And then there are things that are 
chopped up to the extent that they are almost unrecognizable. And there you're talking about something that you can really call uh, loot and the use of a token object. So on your left, you have an entire insular decorated bucket of the kind that, again, may be used for uh, uh, baptism, for carrying holy water, or maybe for serving communion wine in large quantities for a congregation, perhaps. Okay, so they have Christian imagery on them. Uh, a complete one there uh, from Norway, and we have several from Birka and places like these. And here is just a little tiny pound coin sized cutout of one of those sheets. So at this point, you are talking about a little stud on a belt or a little badge that you wear on your cloak. At this point, it's almost unrecognizable. And that is just, uh, uh, even though it is maybe not traveled far from its parent monastery here in the Hebrides as well, it's very much transformed. And you can see something more like that expectation that we have of something being looted, and treated in a way completely alien uh, to its intended purpose, okay? So we can have the full spectrum and just to zoom in on one bucket from Birka so you can see the kind of leg and hip scrolls of an animal sort of twisted on itself, which is the kind, almost uh, identical kind of motif that's being, uh, that's being seen here on Collinsy. Um, we actually have two of these buckets, or at least pieces of buckets. Uh, uh, it, when you find them in, in Norway, uh, they're generally from women's graves. Uh, but in, in Scotland, uh, we have one uh, from a male grave as well. All that we have on display is this little mount here. You've got the little four animal heads looking inwards. That is something that is repeated on Christian metalwork and on Pictish brooches as well. They're like protecting uh, the handle of this bucket here. And that comes with pieces of the sheet that would have held that bucket together. That's found in this uh, grave with uh, a very ostentatious sword. Uh, and the, a, a really good parallel for this little bucket mount comes from another uh, grave there from Birka. Uh, a, a more elaborate version of that same thing. So these things sometimes are traveling hundreds, thousands of miles, I mean, uh, overseas uh, in their complete state, but they can also be used in that local context. And I wonder if they really mean the same thing when they're being repurposed in these two contexts. One really evocative example then, which kind of folds all of these possibilities together into one is the woman who was buried in West Ness uh, on the Isle of Rause in Orkney. It was discovered in 1963. And she, is, uh, she has the greatest amount, the greatest variety of objects of any woman uh, uh, in a grave buried so far that we've discovered in Scotland. Uh, she's got tools dress items, and uh, all sorts of things. But what I like about it is that the beads on her beaded necklace are from the four corners of Europe all the way out to the Middle East, perhaps. And the objects in her grave are also redolent of the four corners of the known world. Scandinavian oval brooches, one on each shoulder, Northumbrian made strap ends, and this Pictish or Irish brooch pin buried complete not damaged except by age because it was a hundred years old or more by the time it was buried here. So someone has taken the most exemplary example of a brooch pin and used it uh, as a dress item in this grave. So in this case with the brooch pin, it is something that has been treated as that heirloom with respect without repurposing it in that way. Uh, but then in that same grave, we have the insular shrine mat that you see in the center. That has clearly been chopped off of a larger parent object. And it's been argued that this is maybe uh, the lion, the evangelist symbol of the lion, and that maybe it's come from a very elaborate book cover. And that's been refashioned 
chopped up and made into a brooch again. So here you have that tension of wearing things as maybe they would have been worn, these strap ends in Northumbria, but also uh, repurposing all of these other things. Both of these ideas can be held in this one woman's costume. And I think that's a really sort of fascinating and maybe, yeah, a, a, a sort of rich text that we can read in ways more complicated than just sort of calling it loot. This is the kind of parent object that this object would have come from. And it means, and, and, and again, I have to stress that what's interesting about this is that objects like these do not survive in Scotland, despite the fact that we find so many objects like this chopped up and repurposed. Okay, so this is an example of a very ornate book shrine cover uh, from a, a, a relic, a book uh, uh, sorry, a book reliquary uh, from Loch Kinnail, uh in Ireland. Okay, so that's the kind of thing that something like this would have been chopped down from. But Loch Kinnail is one of the only surviving examples of a rich sort of treasure book cover or shrine cover uh, uh, like this. The rest of them that we have are in bits and pieces like these. Okay, so these are objects that have been reduced to only very small amounts and then sometimes repurposed. OK, uh, here you have a, a lovely sort of running scroll with animals in it, OK, biting their tails, very similar to the bucket shrines that I showed you. But this is quite a robust object with a very clear frame on top here with this lovely classicizing egg and dart ornament. This is clearly something like a reliquary or more likely uh, a book cover like that. And you have that same kind of running scroll here from a very small token thing. So these things are interesting from a Viking perspective. They're chopping these things down and reusing them and repurposing them as dress items. Wonderful. But they're also, for me, a window on what we've lost. Uh, uh, and not just to the Vikings, but also to the depredations of the uh, Norman conquest and the monastic reforms and the Reformation and everything else that comes after. These things are objects that simply don't survive. And I like thinking through what objects they may have come from. Here's something that we have on display in the National Museum, but is only partially, uh, uh, only a part of this story is on display. This is called a processional cross. It's five disc-shaped bosses of bronze, and in between them, vine scroll ornaments stamped on really lovely thin sheets of copper, reddish, uh, not bronze, but copper sheet, because copper sheet is really soft and it's easy to emboss in this way. And we have examples of other sort of uh, uh, embossed copper alloy sheets that have been sort of uh, riveted onto wooden cores to make them into things like these. So here's a parcel that was found in a really boggy area in the upland zone of Dumfrieshire, way far from settlement, but in a watery place. And it was 50 pieces folded into packets and buried together. And they were carefully unfolded and reconstructed into this. But the problem is that there's much more to it than that. There's those five bosses in the center. There's the vine scroll embossed sheets that you see on your left. And then there's a lot of material still left over. And you can see on your right there, there's one with a hand and there's other ones that have sort of uh, uh, floral motifs and discs, and that might be a hair, uh, a hair or a toga or a robe or something. And it has been reconstructed uh, in an article that was published in the Transactions of Dumfries and Galloway uh, Naturalist and Natural History and Antiquarian Society Journal in 2006. It's been reconstructed as something like this, the kind of thing that absolutely does not survive in Scotland or Ireland except in little fragments. And again, this is so complicated and so bitty that it's very difficult to display, but it gives you a sense of what's maybe been lost uh, from this area. And that running vine scroll, in the time that Aegon Vomers was writing in the 1980s, we actually didn't have a lot of vine scroll in metal from Scotland. And now we, we have quite a few of these things. Uh, here's another version of that egg and dart motif that I showed you on the, uh, on the other example of a possible book shrine mount. It's, there's the sort of uh, uh, the, the, the arc and there's the egg, you know? Uh, uh, and that kind of motif is arrayed around a central amber stud on this object here. And I show you this drawing to show you that it's actually 
uh, concave. Uh, this is a heavy object. It's robust, but sadly, it doesn't have any context. We just call it the West of Scotland Mount because that's where uh, uh, it, it, that's how it was listed when it came up for auction in the 1920s. And you can see uh, very clearly in the drawing here that it's had a hole blasted through on either side uh, where there's an iron nail that's been driven through. So this is something that's been popped off of an object and reused. Frankly, we don't know what kind of object this comes from. It's very robust. It's quite 3D in that concave shape that it has, and it's got a whacking great uh, amber stud on it. Uh, this is an elaborate thing, and when it was uh, uh, when it was sort of pristine, it would have been a very striking thing. Uh, we have other examples of quite hefty disc-shaped mounts that have come off of parent objects that we don't actually understand either. Here's one which is coincidentally uh, almost identical diameter to that one from the west of Scotland, but in much better shape with blue glass and rock crystal studs. This would have come off of something truly ornate and elaborate as well. And it has been repurposed, but again, no context, only Ireland, you know? This one is one from our museum that does have a context. It's a disc mount of a very similar kind. In this case, 70 uh, millimeters, so about twice the size of the ones that I've showed you here. So even larger, and I show you this profile view so you can see, again, not concave, but very much 3D. This is hollow on the inside, but it sticks out of its parent object, and it's missing a very large stud, which would have been another gem of some sort there in the middle. This one, we do know its context has come from, yet again, a woman's grave. Uh, and here it's been used as a belt mount, perhaps, or uh, a mount for a purse or a bag, because the person is already wearing their oval brooches. They have a chain running between them. Their, uh, their dress or cloak is cinched by this belt, and they also have a brooch. So it is not a brooch. It is not being used as a fastener. Again, it's one of these objects that's being treated as a separate and possibly interesting object on its own. But that repeating shape, the circular boss, the circular disc, and very sort of convex in many cases, a large central glass stud here, uh, a large metal roundel there, but surrounded by those snakes there on the left. The Lilleberger one, which is now in the British Museum, was only rediscovered in a parcel of organic sort of mineralized material. And you can see a clump of that textile adhering to the pin on the back. This one uh, was actually one of these objects that is again folded in either the folds of a cloak or wrapped up and shrouded on its own despite having been reused. So these things sometimes are worn and sometimes are kept. And there's a fascinating recent article uh, 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 by Zanette Glorstad, which draws attention to that circular shape, that disc shape, and finds parallels for it in other heirlooms, not of insular manufacture, that are found in Vendel, and then finally Viking Age graves. There is, uh, there is an idea here brewing that maybe there is a, there is a, a, a sort of fashion or a ritual function that circular metalwork objects like these had on brooches and fibulas uh, going Going back uh, to the pre-Viking age, and in the age of the Viking raids, these disc-shaped mounts are being repurposed because they stand in for something circular. And maybe, just maybe, these things retain an essence of that sacred quality that they may have had when they were complete, when they were bosses. What these things are, it's still unknown. Most people uh, just say maybe it's come off of a shrine or it's come off of a decorated book shrine like that Loch Kinale, which does have five bosses on it. Another possibility is that stone and wooden crosses had metal insets in them. And I think that's quite unlikely with the ones that we've been looking at. The sizes of hollows that we do know on crosses are much bigger in the case of St. John's Cross or much smaller in the case of Lastingham. But we do know that these things could be multimedia. Okay, so they did have insets and maybe relics set into them, uh, but I haven't found a really good match uh, between insets on stone and the kinds of things that have been found here. Oh yes, and just to say, St. John's actually has two cavities, which we don't know what they're for. But we do have very large 
bowls and uh, a, a very large sort of square and circular mounts with lips or rims, which were indeed uh, uh, sort of nailed onto a wooden base. And these seem to be uh, uh, used for wooden crosses, perhaps, or maybe very elaborate sort of shrines. But again, these things are the things that are being singled out and reused, apparently with some amount of care, uh, repurposed in sort of Viking graves. So the question, again, with these things remains, uh, do they need to be recognized as Christian objects? Absolutely not. But are they uh, imbued with a kind of sacred power, a ritual agency, perhaps? Uh, it's absolutely possible. And I think the way that some of these things are being treated, I think we can add that to our repertoire of interpretations. OK, uh, in the time I have remaining, I know we started a little bit late, but I just kind of want to cycle through some really killer examples things that I like in our collection. And, uh, you know, we can't sort of go through it all in any great detail tonight, but there is a book. It's called Crucible of Nations. You can read more about these things after the fact. I just want to flash up some really interesting examples, things that I find really fascinating. Okay. More of those lead weights in a famous Viking grave there from Killoran Bay. I mentioned that many of these weights have heads of animals or people. There's a nice little animal head, very similar to the animal head that I showed you at the beginning of the lecture, a, a beast's head with a sort of a curled snout as if they were snarling or grasping something. You see that again and again. Um, and that is the sort of thing that was selected for this weight. And you can see the lead cake sort of shaped uh, around it. It's not completely random. They sort of made this object to fit around that bit of metalwork and not vice versa. And that's the case with every object in this case. They've got the bit of metal and they've shaped the lead to fit the object. Uh, they haven't just popped the object onto any old cake of lead. Okay, there's other insular things in this grave. Very, very interesting. We do know that these balance scales and these sets of weights were deposited in Viking graves. In this one uh, from Norway is a fascinating example because there is an insular bowl or maybe one of these uh, uh, disc-shaped uh, uh, concave bosses that I was showing you before, but this one's been repurposed as a box for this set of balance, uh, balance scales and weights. And there is an argument, although it's never been substantiated as yet, that these balance scales and balance scales like these are actually being made in insular contexts rather than in Scandinavia. So there's a possibility that sort of not just the insular metalwork, but the object itself, the balance, is something that is being manufactured in an insular context. Doesn't mean it was made by a Christian, uh, but there is Christian symbolism on some of these. Okay, so there's an interesting bit of the story. Back to the Shan Mullah Horde, the Black Water Horde, more examples of these things. Uh, uh, and we can see very interestingly the finished objects, those lead weights, in set, but we also see bits of insular metalwork, bits of reliquaries that are being made into them. You can kind of see the stages of the process from a full chunk of a reliquary to a disc cut out of one of those reliquaries to then that disc being used for one of these lead weights. And this coin of Alfred kind of helps us date that to the late ninth century. Okay, and, and, and another just interesting tidbit, that same issue of coin, the same Alfred with the same money or is also found at the Viking camp dated to 872 or 873 in Torxey, Lincolnshire. So it might give us a sense of the date for that hoard there in the Blackwater. It gives us a sort of historical context for these things. It's not just Christian metalwork either. It is insular objects. These are ringed pins found in the Shanmullah hoard. These are originally Irish dress items that are, I don't know, they, uh, the Vikings kind of take a liking to them and they begin to manufacture them uh, in great amounts in towns like Viking Dublin. So this is an object where 
it's an insular item that is appropriated in that colonial context. And before long, they begin to make ring pins like these all across the Viking world, even in Scandinavia. So there's, uh, uh, there's more than just loot. It's an insular object that is repurposed, appropriated, and made into a Viking object, a Viking age object, these ringed pins. So all of these things uh, are possible. And one thing I really love about these ringed pins as well is that they begin to make them, as I mentioned, in Scandinavia. And some of these Scandinavian ones begin to come back to Scotland, Ireland, and England. Here's two examples of Scandinavian made ring pins that came back uh, 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 to these islands, kind of like bringing coals to Newcastle. Okay, last thing, I want to highlight two key objects two key uh, hordes that I think are telling us some really interesting local stories. Viking objects that give us a window on the Viking age in Scotland. Okay, here's an unloved and quite forgotten hoard. It doesn't have the piles and piles of silver arm rings or you know, uh, 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 or, or things that you typically find in a Viking hoard. So it's been called a Pictish metalworkers hoard. It's just bits and pieces, a few beads, a few brooches, but everything kind of clipped up and damaged. And it's been kind of dismissed as like a tinkerer's or a, 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 a sort of a uh, a, a Pictish metal worker uh, uh, or craftsperson's uh, cache of objects that they buried for whatever reason. In photographing these objects again, we always knew that they had these interesting markings on them. And don't miss that sort of back turned beast on the side there, very similar to those reliquaries. Uh, uh, but it's a balance beam. That's something that you don't usually find in hordes, you find it in graves or in settlement sites. But this is not the same kind of balance beam as we saw at Killoran Bay. This one has been modified. It's got sort of uh, uh, notches cut into one side. So it no longer works as an equal armed balance. It's been made into a steel yard, the kind of sliding, uh, the sliding scale that you see in doctor's offices today. And there's very few of these. Uh, 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 there's one from a Viking grave. Again, it looks like an equal arm balance with those back turned beasts, almost certainly made in an insular context, but ended up in a ninth century Viking grave. So the one from the Croy Horde begins to look a little bit more Viking y, I suppose, than Pictish y, unless this is in origin a Pictish or at least an insular object. And this is the only other one I know of. It's from the Isle of Man, but from no context, again, with those bird headed beasts on either side. In photographing these objects, we turned it all around. We looked at it very closely. We looked at those markings, which seem to be picking out one or other notch as if these are target weights that you are sort of aiming for one gram, two gram, three grams. But on the back of it, when we looked really closely, it caught the light in a weird way, and we realized it had a runic inscription on it. And this is something that's been in the collection since 1875, I believe, and it was never noticed. It was kind of lacquered over. It's so faint. Uh, we picked it out. We showed it to David Parsons, our sort of uh, expert runologist friend uh, who works at the University of Wales. Um, he read the Galloway Horde runic inscriptions, the old English inscriptions, and identified this as yet another Anglo-Saxon rather than Norse runic inscription. It just means weigher or to weigh. It just names the object. This is a balance scale, basically. So here is a very weird kind of object, one of a very small number, which is probably made in an insular context, maybe even in a monastery, looking at those back turned beasts with an Anglo Saxon runic inscription, but in the heartland of the kingdom of the Picts in the Viking Age. There's a lot of stories that we can spin out of this, and you can read more about it in the book. But I think what this is all telling us is that what we call the Viking Age isn't just populated by Vikings, it is. Uh, the real people who experienced these changes and in some cases took advantage of those opportunities. Power vacuums were created in the Viking Age by this violence, by the sort of kneecapping of kingdoms, by the regime change, and yes, the burning down of monasteries. And other monasteries, other rulers, and other entities stepped in to fill those vacuums, and they weren't always Danes. They weren't always the Norse. It was other people 
uh, locally. And, uh, uh, you know, the, we know the great army, uh, the Viking great army is made out of uh, various groups of people, various different war bands. And it's possible that some of these are people they picked up along the way, you know, and things like these, this hacked up group of objects uh, taken from a, a, a Pictish monastery or a Pictish power center and repurposed by, in this case, somebody who is speaking English, perhaps speaking old English, I should say, and literate in that language. Okay, this takes us back to all of those Viking graves with insular objects in them. Can we say something more than just a loot when we see insular objects? Can we begin to sort of uh, broaden out the kind of stories that we tell? And crucially, can we start to turn our gaze inwards, looking at these objects and thinking about what it meant in that insular context? What did it mean for the Picts who were experiencing these raids? What did it mean for people who learned a new language? What did it mean for the Gaels who learned Norse and became the Gaul Gale? You know, there are these insular stories as well as those sort of Scandinavian stories. And I think we would do well uh, to tell a richer story of the Viking Age by paying attention to them both. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Adrian. That was absolutely fascinating. I'll give you a second to catch your uh, breath after that tour de force uh, through the National Museum's collections. Um, there's been plenty of discussion and questions in the chat, and I'll, I'll do my best to kind of summarise that and wade through it. And I'll just give everyone a wee second because I've got no doubt that there'll be plenty of other questions heading your way. Now, we do have a huge audience tonight. Um, I think we're currently at 100 and 125. Um, so we don't want to push Adrian over the edge with questions, but we will, uh, if he's kind enough to, to give up a little bit more of his time, we will try and address as many as we can. Um, so the the first question I think that we'll raise um, is from our very own Colleen Beatty, um, who was asking right at the very beginning of your paper when you're talking about, you know, are these actually uh, Viking hordes and, and things like that. And um, could it still be Viking hordes, though perhaps these items have been through many hands before the Vikings get a hold of them? Yes, absolutely. Um, it, the, these could, there's any number of interpretations for uh, why these things would have been signed, I suppose, in this uh, Old English script, uh, but deposited as one of these hordes. Yes, one of the possibilities is that this has been uh owned or gathered or assembled by english speakers but for some reason or another ends up ultimately in viking hands but the reverse is also true and i think we kind of default very easily when we call them viking hordes or viking age hordes even that that word is still front of mind and i think it's just one of these things that we can sort of uh we can add this to the pot of possibilities and i'll say as well uh thanks for your question by the way colleen and, and hello nice to sort of see you uh, even though i can't see you um and, and i will say i mentioned this paper by john sheehan but his work has shown as well that uh the thing about the Irish Viking Age hordes is that they're almost invariably found outside of what we know are the Viking settlements. They have these Viking towns and, and Viking enclosures uh, and places where there's Viking graves, which means that there are people settled there of a pagan persuasion. Uh, um, and the hordes are found inland. They're found on churches, as, as, as John Sheen has pointed out, but also in uh, local uh, ring forts and things like these, you know? So uh, most of the Irish Viking hordes are actually found outside of Viking areas. And, and the Galloway horde is, is, is one of these potentially uh, 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 examples uh, here from Scotland, you know? All the rest of the silver hordes of this size and this kind of makeup in Scotland are found in the Hebrides and the Northern Isles, exactly where we'd expect. That's where we know there's Vikings living, the you know, uh, but this one seems to be kind of more on that sort of Irish model, where it's outside of an area of known sort of Viking settlement. So yeah, it's just a a, a rich one there. You can really sort of conjure uh, and use your imagination a bit more with these. We've actually continuing that thought. We've had a couple of questions about hordes themselves and what the purpose behind the hordes are and whether, you know, they reflect they reflect different things depending on where they're found. Uh, Myra, for example, was asking in the chat whether this, is this about claiming territory with, you know, placing hordes in certain areas. Um, I don't know if you want to, what do you think is going on here? Is, is it, is it 
too much of kind of too many variables depending on what you're looking at to be specific as to you know what the, the Vikings were doing with these things. No, I, I think, I mean, obviously with every single one of them, I think you, you should be specific. I think it's putting these things in their landscape context as much as possible. It's uh, looking at what comes before, during, and after the time of that hoard deposit and sort of taking all those things into account. Uh, I think rather than sort of saying one blanket thing, these are none of them are Viking hordes and all of them are Viking hordes. It's actually taking them on a case by case basis. I think we can apply the same thing with stray finds, with metal detected finds, with hordes, and to a certain extent, perhaps with uh, burial deposits as well. You know, I think we have to take into that context, is it in a sort of cemetery with other sort of fringe graves? Is it in or near a church? You know, and kind of take all of these things on a case by case by, uh, by case basis, rather than just sort of applying a blanket these are all Viking graves or these are all Viking hordes. I think the more specific we get, the better our archaeology is going to be. The dangerous framework, eh? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, we've had a couple of questions as well relating to the transfer of ideas and whether this is um, Scandinavian metalworking and, and art being influenced by Irish and Celtic are, or whether it's vice versa, or whether it's a mix of both. I think you've partially answered this with reference to the pins that you you mentioned towards the end there. But um, is the you know is this a one way kind of traffic zone in terms of the transfer ideas? Hope we've not lost Adrian there. Just give him a wee second to see if he comes back. I'm afraid we'll be in trouble if we're relying on myself to answer those questions. Adrian's just texted me panically there to say that his laptop is uh, restarting. So we'll just give him a, a wee minute to see if he can rejoin. Which uh, gives everyone a, a chance to catch their breath and run and grab a, a coffee or a, a glass of water while we wait. Please do keep the questions coming. We'll try and get through as many of them as we can, uh, providing Adrian's uh, laptop is, is playing ball now. So Adrian just saying that he's just trying to join us now. So, okay. 
There we go. Hello. Back in action. Hey, okay. Sorry about that. Yeah, we've no, had every, okay. every kind of technical difficulty tonight. Um, so we were just talking about um, the trans, this idea of the transfer of ideas and a particular reference to art styles and whether this is um, originating in Scandinavia and traveling to um, kind of Celtic areas or vice versa. Yeah, I, I I think that's really interesting. You're getting um you're getting a bit of that. Um, there's less, I think, evidence of um, uh, sort of insular art styles uh, becoming influential in Scandinavia. Although there is a lot of debate, I understand about uh, Mammon style and Ernest style, and to what extent these things have um, a sort of hybrid quality to them. Um, uh, of course, once the Ernest style uh, takes hold, it's very much in a sort of Christian context, and you see them on sort of Christian runestones uh, and, and grave slabs with beasts and, and sort of uh, designs on them, but they're in a sort of, they're in Christian churchyards and things like these. And so there's an element of that, but that's much later. These are sort of 11th century developments at the time when much of Scandinavia is uh, already uh, sort of converting or has converted to Christianity. So there's 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 not a lot of evidence of, of, of sort of the influence going that way, although certain ideas do take hold. So that ring pin, that dress fastener, but another one that I find really interesting is the penannular brooch. This is the sort of horseshoe shaped brooch, um, the, the sort of hoop with an open terminal. That's something that uh, uh, isn't really a Scandinavian uh, type of object at all. And they do begin to make objects like penannular brooches um, in, in, in the sort of late ninth and into the tenth centuries, and it's fascinating. There's only a couple of uh, uh, there's only a dozen or so of these examples still left, but some of the earliest examples of those penannular brooches made in Scandinavia are copies of Pictish brooches. So there is a little moment in time there where the earliest forms of ringed pins and penannular brooches, these new kinds of dress fasteners brought over from the new world are just copies of insular ones. And then they begin to incorporate those into uh, Scandinavian dress styles. So you get penannular brooches with Boris style ornaments and things like these. But there's a generation or so where they're just imitations or copies uh, or just complete looted examples. And they're specifically Pictish in some cases as well. So there's a, you know, the Picts are always kind of the uh, 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 the loser in this battle. The mm -hmm. Picts are the ones that disappear, and the Vikings become the late Norse and the, you know uh, the Earls of Orkney and that. And so the Picts are seen as the kind of loser in in all of these. But there's examples of that where there is Pictish metalwork and Pictish sort of dress items and things specifically uh, that take hold and are influential, especially in Norway. So I think there is a little bit more give and take. I think than we give credit for. Yeah. Cool. Um, there was a little bit of a discussion in the chat about one of the um, items that you showed in one of the slides, um, the furnace head, um, which look maybe Roman. I don't know if you could comment upon that. A couple of people in the chat suggesting that is that Roman. Mm, uh, I, I think it's been it's been seen as a Christian object by the uh, uh, the style of the beard and the the, the person might have a tonsured uh, uh, hairdo, but uh, uh, all uh, er everything I know about these objects comes from these very respected books uh, <laughs> like the work of angels. And so if they call it early medieval, I tend to follow them. OK, so people like Susan Young's people like Rhino Lafloin uh, who write about these things and uh, I stand on their shoulders. Uh, with these things. It doesn't look terribly Roman to me, uh, but again, yeah, the work of angels by Sue Young's features that object. You can read more about it there. That's a very sensible answer, uh, I feel. Um, there was a, a little bit of discussion as well about these, uh, the discs that you were you were discussing mm -hmm. and potentially what the, the uses of them could be. And uh, Jane McNally was asking whether they are perhaps weights to keep pages down on, on open books. Could that possibly be the, the origin? Like paperweights. Yeah. Uh, the the thing is that some of them have evidence um, for uh, a sort of a, having been riveted. Not all of them, mind you. Some of them have evidence that they have been originally riveted onto something, especially those with flanges with sort of flat rims around them. Uh, those look to have been uh, nailed or riveted onto again something like a wooden board 
uh, a, a wooden base. Uh, uh, but not all of them do. Not all of them do. Sometimes the only uh, perforations that they have are from that reuse when they've been made into brooches or something similar. Uh, it looks like they're held in place by the frame of whatever it is uh, that they're being set into. Uh, uh, and so they're really enigmatic objects, really. Uh, uh, and uh, they're probably not from a single kind of object either. They're probably not all from book shrines, and they're probably not all processional crosses or altar crosses. There's probably a mix of these things. But there is, regardless of what they come from, it's that shape and the size of it that is. That, uh, that is attracting a certain amount of looting. You see that disc form of object again and again and again repurposed and something's cut down into discs as well. And, and, and so there's, a, there's something about that circular object, a weird, exotic, sometimes heirloom, you know, hundreds of year old object. Uh, and that's something that again, uh, as Annette Glorstad has pointed to is saying that that matches with the kind of objects that are used as the third brooch, as the central brooch. Uh, in between the oval brooches, there is a clasp holding the dress or the tunic together. Um, and quite often, that third brooch uh, is uh, a, a very old object or a very unique uh, object. A and that's true before the Viking Age as much as during. It's just that during the Viking Age, looted metalwork or repurposed metalwork, I suppose we should call it, is what takes that position quite mm -hmm. often as a third brooch. Super. Uh, there's there's a few comments and things in, in the chat, which I, I won't flag just now, but I'll pass them all on to Adrian um, so he can have, have a look at them in his own time. Um, and I'll just focus on a couple more questions if we've got a little bit more time. Uh, we've got a question from Julie Tomlinson, um, who's asked, we often think of Vikings as preferring silver to other metals. Do you think that the Vikings desired silver mostly for their weight value, but that gold and other colored metal items were valued more as pieces of art to be repurposed for their, their beauty? That's interesting. I mean, I, I don't think we can make a, any sort of blanket statement about uh, uh, about any one metal or over another, except insofar as it's the silver that is uh, most often hoarded. So the Shan Muller hoard uh, and things like these are actually quite rare. These assemblages of uh, of copper alloy things uh, are, are actually quite rare. But it was Colleen Beatty, actually, Callback, uh, who, who pointed out to me that the very large spillings hoard, which is actually several sort of caches of silver arm rings and stuff put together, was buried alongside a huge parcel of hacked up copper alloy as well. So they can, they, they, uh, 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 you do find hordes of copper alloy objects. So thank you, Colleen, for bringing that to my mm -hmm. attention. They are more common, I suppose, uh, uh, but it's silver almost invariably uh, rather than gold and rather than copper alloy that is dropped in these hordes. And the, the, the interpretation there is that silver is liquid. It's got this sort of economic active value. It can be used for ornaments, but it can also be chopped up. So it can be sort of rendered into money or an ornament very easily. It can kind of cross those categories in a way that gold didn't really. Gold was used for high profile ornaments and high profile transactions. So you do get gold arm rings, uh, but they're very rare and they're really uh, more often buried complete rather than hacked up into little bits. And so when you use a gold arm ring uh, or a gold neck ring, uh, you use the whole thing because mm -hmm. it's a showy thing. And so gold has an economic value, but it also has this sort of ineffable kind of prestige value uh, far and above silver. And then the copper alloy stuff that we're getting repurposed into these objects, uh, into these brooches and these mounts and uh, trinkets, you know, amulets potentially, uh, almost invariably uh, gilt copper alloy. And so those things are not necessarily being uh, uh, reused for their precious metal content, but something else, their visual aesthetic. And Steve Ashby and several other people who have written about insular metalwork have drawn the attention to the zoomorphic 
imagery, the zoomorphic ornament, the sort of writhing animals or, uh, as things that are kind of uh, interesting from a Scandinavian aesthetic point of view, but they may also be protective. They may be sort of acting in a, uh, a kind of protective way. Uh, and, and so some of that, to get back to your question, then there are different values ascribed to different materials and certainly different values ascribed to different metals. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's part of what our interpretation of these things has to be. Picking up on a couple of points that you, you've made there, um, one of the questions asked how insular items are described within Scandinavian museum collections. Is there a disconnect there between how they're interpreted within Scandinavia to how you're interpreting them here? <laughs> um, uh, 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 yes and no. Um, for for instance, some of the best work on this stuff, and I've cited them already. It's uh, 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 it's Heen Pedersen and uh, Zanette Glorstad and places and, and people like this. There's many more that that, that one could name, uh, and these are scholars working out of the uh, Scandinavian museums and universities who are kind of leading the way. The, the, I've I've been very much influenced by their work, uh, but it's quite recent. It's sort of in the 2000s, 2010s, and onwards is that their work has sort of come to the fore. Uh, but they've been hugely influential uh, for me. Uh, so yes and no. But one thing I would like to say is that uh, the uh, the more I explore the sort of uh, the catalogs of Nor uh, uh, of Norwegian museums, um, the it's kind of a knee jerk reaction almost. But the way that we used to call these things, we call them insular art now. We used to call them Hiberno Saxon, uh, which is a term that means Irish and English, and it leaves out you know, the Welsh and the Pictish and the Scottish, you know? Uh, so that term has sort of been uh, kind of underplayed now and we've replaced it with insular, which is that more inclusive, I suppose, because we generally don't know if these things are Irish or English or Pictish. They're insular in the sense that they're all sharing this aesthetic. You can't often look at one of these shrines and say, that's Pictish, it's insular. Uh, 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 but in the Norse catalogs are all, often called Irsk. It just means Irish. Uh, and so the, the, it, it's kind of a, it's not sort of an intentional thing. I think that's just the kind of, it's a, not a Scandinavian object. It's kind of one of these things that has entered the catalog through uh, the very first catalogs of this material from the 1920s and 30s. And it was just kind of, at the, in those days, just said to be Irish. And so there, there's one of these sort of hangovers, but you're starting to sort of correct that in the modern literature. Interesting, yeah. Categorization coming back to, to haunt us. Um, we've got a question from, uh, I'm conscious of the time, we'd, we'll just do a, a couple more. Uh, there's there's a huge amount of questions and comments, uh, Adrian, and lots of people saying thank you very much for a, a, an excellent talk. Um, we've got one from Simon Copeland, who's asked um, if you have got any thoughts about Igor Michelson's uh, theories about looting uh, or missioning. I don't know. If oh, you know. yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I, I, I've got, I've got his book here. Uh, it's a fantastic book uh, uh, because it is a sort of catalog uh, county by county in Norway of all the insular objects. Uh, and it's so incredibly valuable it has appendices listing all of the Anglo-Saxon swords from Viking graves. And here's all this kind of balance scale, this kind of coin. Fantastic book. I love that book. Um, but uh, uh, the, 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 the sort of uh, the argument I think Simon is, is referring to there is that where, where you find this Christian metalwork in a Viking grave, it is not necessarily looted all the way from Scotland or Ireland, but actually material that has been brought by missionaries that we know were in operation in, in, in towns like Birka eventually. Uh, there were missionaries working on the continent and there were missionaries that were venturing north during the Viking Age and that this material was captured or uh, taken from missionaries on the continent. Um, it's possible. Uh, 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 and maybe these people were believers as well. Maybe there were people who had been preached to, and these are the kinds of tools of that missionary work. They're not loot at all. They're things that they actually owned and used, maybe. Uh, the, the thing that I would say is that, once again, this insular material, these bits of shrines and reliquaries are also showing up in Viking graves in Scotland and Ireland. And I think we, we have to take that into account. These things 
are not seen as exotic and weird if they're right from down the road from where they're found. They didn't travel thousands of miles in many cases. They were they traveled, you know, just that far. Uh, uh, and so there's a different statement being made. So once they get to Norway, that interpretation is obvious. It makes a lot of sense, actually. Uh, but when you find something like that here, there's a different message. And it might be one that is very specifically anti-Christian to uh, break down a reliquary and make it into a brooch and wear it in your face, mm -hmm. you know, uh, to people who know what that object was and maybe saw the thing when it was a sacred object. That's a very different statement. Uh, and I, I, I find it hard to believe that those are uh, people who are uh, uh, sort of uh, 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 respecting that as a as a Christian object, but again, I've said uh, already numerous times these things are dismantled rather than torn apart. They're taken down with care and they're riveted sometimes with copper alloy rivets, sometimes less carefully. But you know these things are are treated with care uh, and they're not just ripped up and and hacked willy nilly. You know, uh, uh, and so there's just more to the story. I think that's probably the best possible place to end things <laughs> before we fall too further uh, down the rabbit hole. Uh, again, thank you to everyone for all their questions and comments. I'll pass all of these on to Adrian and I'm sure you can uh, chase them up with you as well. Um, all that's left for, for me to do is um, bring matters to a close and ask everyone to join me in the traditional INS awkward uh, virtual round of applause for uh, Dr. Bognau's fantastic paper. Thank you very much, Adrian. Thanks, and thanks everybody for coming. This is, it, it's incredible to see so many people out for <laughs> Hello to Oklahoma. I saw some. <laughs> <laughs> thanks everybody for coming. Thank you, Andrew, for organizing. No, no, our, our pleasure. Um, now, I've just got a couple, uh, Last technical points before everyone disappears into the, the ether. Um, unfortunately, our seminar for next month, um, which was due to be presented by Dr. Sven Kalmering, uh, has to be postponed. Uh, so we'll be taking a little bit of a break next month and then we'll be welcoming Sven back in the autumn. So the next seminar that we'll have is on the 27th of April when we'll be hosting Dr. Simon Egan, who will be presenting his paper, Ireland, Scotland and the wider Gaelic world, rethinking the paradigms. But until then, thank you all for attending from all over the globe. Thank you again to Adrian and enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye for now.